because she's such a rare person. So who is she? Well, she's the first woman to be a manager of a male football team playing in one of the top divisions in Norway. And everybody's asking, how is this possible? Is it really appropriate for women to do that? And is she really qualified? Can she be a manager of a football team? Hence, even if there are huge barriers in South Asia for women who want to have a career and make their voice heard, for women who want to make a footprint, we find pat patriarchal norms and values everywhere. In this book, I was honored to be given the opportunity to write about how gender gaps in access to finance, financial resources have repercussions for gender balance in political representation. The cost of doing politics are enormous. Politicians almost everywhere <clears throat> in the world need access to funding to be able to campaign, arrange uh, rallies, pay their support team, give out handouts and gifts, dress pro properly. So how can you get money to all of this if you don't even have your own bank account? So opportunities of engaging in politics, this starts in the private. This we can see now more than ever. The pandemic that we are facing seems to affect mothers and fathers differently. We are all affected, but what we see is that when schools and daycare closes down, women more than men have to put their careers on hold to take care of the duties at home. And this we can see all over the world. Therefore, the book is timely. It is needed in times like this to reflect upon gender equality and also how different sectors of the societies is interconnected and need to be handled at the same time simultaneously. We need to take, take a gender mainstreaming approach to the challenges we are facing. To make advances in one sector, like politics that I'm studying, we also need equal opportunities for men and women in family life, society, administration, and the economy. So thank you so much for letting me be a part of uh, this um, edited book and also for speaking here today. So thank you so much. I'm truly honored. Thank you, Professor Ranhild. Uh, now let me invite Professor Salahuddin M. Aminu Zaman, advisor SIPG NSU for his kind words, please. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Vice Chair, Governor, Vice Chancellor, and the distinguished speakers and authors. Now, I'm fully aware that I have three minutes, so I have to very quickly over make an overview. Basically, this book has explored some areas of debates, discourses, and gender issues, covering in three broad areas that Dr. Jamil has already mentioned, that is politics, policies, and institutional challenges. Now, I'm just speaking as an author now, now, what I have ventured, actually, I tried my humble best to look into the thematic area of gender budget in Bangladesh. And to be very precise, what I observe in the study, the gender budget in Bangladesh and many of the developing countries that I have looked into generally suffer from three major limitations. First, there appears to be a lack of conceptual clarity as regards the very process, content, and implication of gender budget. That's the first broader observation we have noticed. Second, we also observed in our research that unfortunately there is a serious methodological flaws of the design of gender budget. So that is the second punching point. And third, <clears throat> we also found in the study that there is a blurred understanding on the demand side of gender concerns. Therefore, gender budget itself is blurred. So these are three broad limitations that we actually observed uh, in our study. And then of course, basically as a researcher, we always try to find out what are the new entry points 
or what are the policy concerns that we should be flagging out. And therefore, this particular study on gender budgeting that I have been involved with, uh, we broadly suggested three areas of concern are there. One is in-depth gender analysis with sectoral perspective. <clears throat> because as you know, the budget is not just one single shot. It is a composition of sectoral composition. So we, we came out with that conclusion there that there is a need for sectoral approach to understand and allocate budget than that of one lump approach. And of course, second thing that we discovered that there's also a perhaps need to do from further research in the, in the field of generation of desegregated sector specific data to understand the response need and the focus of gender budget. In other words, gender budget currently at the way being practiced in developing countries are in a bulk, not sector specific and also responsive to the sector specific needs. And third and most importantly, as, as you say, there is a conceptual clarity lacking there. We also notice that uh, we need more professional preparedness to design the gender budget. As of now, what we're talking about gender budget is basically a kind of a loaded rhetoric and we are going with the wind, but not necessarily to seriously we have looked into the implication, nor we are methodologically prepared as such. But that is what I think the findings that the paper I have written or my contributed in this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Our next speaker is Professor Sanjay Kumar, Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi, India. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this book launch. Uh, let me begin by first uh, congratulating the four authors of the book. Uh, normally in the academic world, we keep participating in various seminars. So for two years uh, back when I participated in the seminar, I made a presentation on women in politics. I, and I, and in many seminars, you go and present a paper, but uh, you normally we, we try and come out with a volume, but sometimes it doesn't come. So it makes me very, very happy that finally after the seminar, you know, most of the papers, 13 papers or 11 papers have now been compiled and now it, is, it has been published in the form of a book. Uh, so that makes me very happy and I would again like to congratulate the entire team. Uh, they kept working when at times I was very uh, late in sending my reply to the queries which were raised on the chapter, but finally I did manage to contribute my chapter, which is largely on uh, looking at women in politics in India. Uh, the if we if we look at the title of the book, which is Gender Mainstreaming in Politics, Administration, and Development in South Asia, so it covers a wide range. As has already been mentioned by previous speaker, it looks at politics, it looks at administration, it looks at development, not only in my country, but South Asia, cover India, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. So it, the book has a very wide range to cover. I have done a bit, uh, I have contributed my bit in that. And as I said, I have done, I have written a chapter on uh, political participation uh, of women, uh, participation of women in Indian politics. Um, when I started working on the chapter, I realized that this is an important topic to be addressed. People have been writing on this, but I thought for the benefit of the audience at the moment, I should mention that uh, one big change has happened in Indian politics over the last two, three decades. Uh, if we look at the early elections, the turnout gap between men and women used to be very large. The turnout among women was uh, almost 8, 10, even 15 percent less compared to men turnout. But if we look at what has happened during especially the last three Lok Sabha elections, 2009, 2014 and 2019, now women turnout has increased uh, significantly. 2019 election, the last Lok Sabha elections, men and women have voted in more or less equal number. So the women turnout has gone up 
drastically and i consider this as the biggest electoral revolution in in, in india this is one the biggest change which we have witnessed in indian elections um, so when i started working in my chapter i have presented data over a period of time though there is lot to desired to happen uh, women representation in parliament and state legislative assembly remains low still remains very low but the turnout of women their participation in politics not only at the national level of politics but even in various state that has increased drastically there are about now 14 or 15 states in india where women turnout is higher than men turnout and you would be surprised to know that these are not the very developed state there was a discussion going on when we before we begin the program about kerala and kerala is the state where uh, literacy rate is very high we would expect that this gender parity would be more in kerala but that's not the case gender parity is highest in bihar if we look at politics as such so uh, lots of things i have tried to unfold in the chapter which i have contributed uh, i don't think i have time to go into all those details those details are there in the chapter for the uh, people to read uh, i must thank uh, the north south university csds has a very long association <laughs> With this university, uh, we have been working with this university for very long, and on a Sorry, lighter sir, note, uh, my... for the interruption, uh, that you are actually running yeah, out of time. It will be yeah, better for I'm us finished. if you conclude. Okay, yeah. okay sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so our next speaker is Professor Sayada Lasna Kabir from University of Dhaka. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, and to you all. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm I'm last to give you, and I'm the faculty of as you as she mentioned that the uh, Department of Public Administration, Dhaka University, and I'm also an adjunct faculty, uh, the North South University for you know, for a long time, and I'm happy to tell you that I'm one of the uh, you know member of the editorial board of the. Uh, a book on gender mainstreaming in politics administration and development in south asia and uh, throughout the process i have enjoyed it very much i'm not going to talk uh, uh, more about that because already professor jamil uh, salaudin sir and mr jay also mentioned that so i will uh, straight because of the time constraint i will uh, go straight to my in you know, a chapter uh, so the name of my chapter is uh, through the glass ceiling over the glass cliff women leader in bangladesh Bangladeshi Public Administration. So, if you look at the, you know, the title of the chapter that I'm, I mean, uh, through the glass ceiling over the glass cliff. That means uh, from, you know, from frying pan to fire. Yes. So, yeah. Can you hear me? Huh? Okay. So, frying, frying pan to fire, something like that. So, uh, let me explain a little bit about what is glass cliff, a uh, uh, glass ceiling first. Uh, glass ceiling is the invisible barrier where, um, I mean. Uh, when women and minorities face as they approach to the top management positions in organization and theory like think manager think may uh, can elaborate that men in leadership positions are acceptable and female are not qualified for the leadership position that is in gst you know the theoretical interpretation about the glass uh, ceiling now uh, what is glass cliff a glass cliff is another kind of glass ceiling uh, but glass cliff refers to the women being more likely to rise in the positions in organization uh, when uh, the organization is facing some sort of crisis Yes, that means uh, when chances of failure are very high, women are placed to that positions. That is actually the glass cliff. So uh, if you go to the you know the literature, we will see that uh, uh, think uh, you know crisis think female that can explain or elaborates uh, that during crisis uh, and risky time, female can be hired. Now why? Because uh, organization uh, can win either way. If the women succeeds in, I mean, in the company, uh, I mean, then company gonna better off because uh, the company can prove that it's egalitarian institution or uh, organization. But if she fails, then uh, the company is not worse off because she, the women can be blamed for this failure. So either way, organization gonna win. Uh, Uh, to actually see what sort of glass cliff or glass ceiling uh, this sort of uh, situations are facing by uh, the higher uh, level of civil 
servant, uh, especially female, um, are facing in, in Bangladesh. Uh, I conducted this research and uh, in, uh, in my research, 26 female civil servants uh, were interviewed. Uh, they're from uh, deputy secretary to secretary and to actually discover the nature of their experiences at the top level of the decision-making ranks. That was my objective. And uh, um, through this interview, uh, there are many factors they mentioned um, uh, which affecting the glass cleave uh, uh, phenomenon in the civil service. Uh, those were interpreted in detail in my uh, chapter. I would uh, request you to go through it. You definitely find it quite interesting. Uh, let me uh, I tell you one thing uh, before ending my you know, uh, interpretation about the chapter that uh, I also asked them that how, how, could, how could you actually reduce the risk when you are at the top position? Uh, what, what would be your opinion about that? How you handle that? Uh, they mentioned some uh, options and some you know, uh, opinion, but one important uh, point is very, I mean, uh, I, I, I actually consider myself very interesting. Uh, they said that uh, uh, women associations or networks, that is women's caucus in the civil service is very important mechanism to prevent women from falling off the cliff. So respondents believe that it is important who you know, not what you know. Thank you very much for your patience hearing. Thank you. I think I managed time. Thank you, Professor, for your very nice speech. Our next speaker is Ms. Janetri Lianek from University of Paradenia, Sri Lanka. Ms. Janetri is now in Melbourne and have joined from there. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Janetri Lianeki. Thank you very much for inviting me for this virtual book launch to do, represent Sri Lanka. Um, on behalf of Professor Kamala Lienige, the main author of this book chapter, and myself, I would like to thank all the editors of the book and the attendees of today's book launch, joining even in the midst of the pandemic. And talking about the book, this book is on gender mainstreaming in politics, administration, and development in South Asian countries, covering many approaches um, approaches. So it discusses the concepts and practices, achievements, challenges, and the issues which the book success, which um, the issues that success, uh, sorry, the issues that block the Im successful implementation in South Asian countries. So although Sri Lanka has signed the platform for action at the Beijing uh, conference in 1995, the, and committed achieve, to achieve gender equality and to empower women at all levels, not much attention has been paid to increase the women's participation in governance and development. Talking about Sri Lanka, it actually brags a little bit about women's achievement in education, literacy rate, life expectancy, and so much more. But their representation in governing institutions, whether public or private, is very minimal. So, it's extremely necessary to introduce gender into policies and governance at all levels of Sri Lanka. Many law and policy makers and implementers of Sri Lanka do not have a very clear idea on the concepts of gender mainstreaming, gender budgeting, and they do not consider it as a <clears throat> development strategy. Therefore, the empowerment of women through social, political, and economical institutions are blocked by the patriarchal power structure traditional social norms, and gender stereotypes. To overcome these challenges, it is essential for Sri Lanka to learn from the other South Asian nations on how they incorporated uh, gender mainstream into politics and administration. I believe all these chapters in this book would help Sri Lanka to address such challenges. Our chapter, which examines the gender-based harassment and violence in higher education institutions in Sri Lanka, is a good example to show how the lack of gender sensitivity in policy making and implementation, insufficient um, gender representation in governing bodies and gender stereotypes pushes women, even educated women, into helpless situations. I consider this book uh, it's not just a compilation of several research reports, but it's a valuable collection of practical knowledge, uh, positive as well as negative experiences related to the gender main mainstreaming in national and local context. So I feel that it would be useful not only for researchers, academics and students, but also for administrations, administrators and politicians of our countries. So yes, 
Hope you enjoy the chapter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Janitri, for your speech. Our next speaker is Dr. Mizanur Rahman from Bangladesh Rural Development Academy, Kumilla. You hear me? I think you can hear me. Honorable Chair and BC Sir, respected editors, professor from different universities, distinguished discussant, and the authors, dear organizer and director of SIPG, Professor Dr. Tofik and his inter team members. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum, Namaskar, and very good evening. Dear August gathering, let me share some of my points, some of the points of my chapter. In the last 150 years, local governments, particularly Union Parishad, have always been dominated by men. Women's entry in the UP began in 1997 through reservation of one third seats for women. Following this, a huge number of women were elected in the UPs for the first time in the history of decentralized governance of Bangladesh. The basic argument of this chapter was that amidst serious struggle to initiate their role and participation in the Union Parishad, women leaders have been able to make some positive differences in rural governance. Against such a backdrop, the chapter aimed to explore two research questions. What did women leaders do to make a difference in the rural society? And how did they do it? To explore these questions, qualitative methods such as phenomenological analysis, case studies, content analysis, and observation method were explored, uh, employed. Women's participation in the UP was analyzed from two different theoretical standpoints, such as theory of political representation and critical mass theory. Based on the empirical findings, it was found that having ensured their limited rights Six. and roles in the UP, some women member or some women leaders were providing culturally suitable social justice to women through participating in the rural shalis that is a quasi-judicial system. In this way, they help the vulnerable segment of the rural society. Through NGO environment and the process of collectivization, these women leaders developed huge social capital. Thus, these women leaders were able to provide various pro poor benefits and services. Due to their community mentality, uh, some women leaders become super social workers in reality. The formal local institutions have always failed to serve good governance for the poor and women. Whereas after the inclusion of women in local government, we observe that women's representation is making a difference, but it is at an initial stage. Over time, women's continuous representation in the union Purishud is likely to result a critical mass which transform local government substantially. Provided a suitable atmosphere, these women leaders will prove their representation useful and foster more social changes and welfare in rural Bangladesh in the days to come. Thank you once again, the organizer and other professors involved with it. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rahman, for your nice speech. Our next speaker is Dr. Shongita Dhal from University of Delhi, India. Yeah. Uh, good evening, all of you. Hope I'm able to. I hope I'm audible to all of you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're audible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, today, it gives me immense satisfaction. The journey that we began in November 2017, the International Conference, has finally resulted in the publication of the work. My thanks, heartfelt thanks, goes to the uh, con uh, the organizers of the conference, uh, the uh, publishers who you know painstakingly uh, took the effort of uh, you know for this uh, meaningful work, and uh, of course the publishers. And uh, uh, congratulations to all my co-authors who have written on this very important, diverse topic. 
topic, you know, which is uh, uh, contextualizing the gender perspective in, in the region of South Asia, which is culturally heterogeneous, socially diverse, politically uh, very sensitive. And uh, my uh, chapter in this book, which I've contributed, is empowering women uh, <coughs> through e-governance capacity building as an enabling measure i've used i've i've you know uh, tried to uh, portray capacity building as uh, the concept as a tool of women's empowerment and how it is you know it can be uh, used to address the uh, skill deficit which uh, which uh, uh, you know puts the women at a, a disadvantaged position as compared to the male uh, counterparts now my study focuses on the common rural uh, on the common service centers now so common service centers are these rural telecenters which are there in india and they now their number is now on, uh, nearly 3 lakhs and how they have tried to bring about a transformation through the through providing uh, digital services e services uh, especially government to citizen services how they have provided uh, to bring about an immense kind of a social change and in this you know a government has tried to uh, uh, to promote women uh, 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 operators you know the the common service operators but in my book i i in my chapter i have tried to you know portray the fact that how the the prejudice you know how these women they live through their gender identities each day every day so it's a kind of a prejudice that they feel that that they have to you know uh, uh, uh. Address every time, and uh, nevertheless, it is very important as a tool for their empowerment, and not only it contributes to their household income, but also it you know contributes to the inclusive growth. So uh, all of this I've tried to bring about uh, in my chapter, and I I really hope that uh, and I was uh, in fact happy to see that there have already been 50 downloads of this chapter, uh, but nevertheless I I really wish the maximum readership of uh, this book and i congratulate everyone who has been involved in this project and i would love to be uh, uh, able to participate in the future also thank you so much all of you thank you dr shongita for your nice speech our next speaker is ms zinat hossein phd researcher k u leven belgium oh. ms zinat hossein are you there I'm here. Okay. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, share my chapter. You know, can you uh, switch on your my camera, please? I think it's switched on. I sent a text long before that. Do you see me or not? Because I think there is something wrong here. Okay, you continue, uh, please. Yeah. But I can continue, of course. Yeah. So uh, congratulations to all the editors and the respective authors and uh, the panelists. I will go directly to my, to my chapter, which is titled as uh, How Policy Falls Back Before Implementation, a study on unequal inheritance right in Bangladesh. Um, uh, so we, as we all know, the policy formulation as well as implementation is always challenging particularly when uh, the policy doesn't represent the belief and sentiment of the society. Considering that, um, we take the case of unequal inheritance right issue in Bangladesh, and we try to explore how national women's development Has lost connection. Rudmila, please. Yeah, I think she has lost connection. So, uh, hello. Can I go? Uh, no. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you can continue. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yes. So, uh, in this paper, we take the case of unequal inheritance right issue in Bangladesh and we try to explore how national women's development policy, uh, which contains the regulation on ensuring women's equal inheritance rights has discontinued long before its implementation. So we try to identify the background of this policy and how it is contested and what makes the policy to be folded back. Um, if, we, if we just 
say a bit of the context, uh, you know, the Bangladesh is a secular state, but in regards of inheritance, uh, marriage and personal affairs, it follows the respective religious law. So the Muslims, for example, who, co which, who constitutes most of the population, follows the Sharia law in their family marriage, property distribution and other personal affairs. So as informed by the key informants in my study, uh, there are a number of disparities in Sharia law uh, for example, the daughters get half of the paternal inheritance than that of the brothers. Alternatively, according to Islamic scholars, they say that uh, Islam gives women the proper right and compensated the inheritance through other benefits like dower or maintenance. Based on that, uh, we find out the background, I mean, the National Women's uh, Development Policy, which was first formulated in 1971, uh, 1997, where the equality has been ensured and written, but the draft didn't come out. And then in 2004, it again had a discussion and it dropped the clause. And then again in 2011, uh, this, this policy came out and uh, there was a huge discussion about it uh, and there was a draft declared. But after immediately uh, the draft has been declared, there are several opposition coming from the Islamic group as a reaction and uh, they come out on the street, they called Hortal, and there was a big debate on these issues. And at the end, we found that there's a, a dialogue between our uh, respected prime minister and with the, with the Islamic um, uh, fundamentalist group and some other madrasa uh, teachers. Um, and then there is a promise that there will be nothing contradictory, nothing will be given that contradicts the Sharia laws. And uh, this, this policy, uh, that's how the policy of the clause inside the policy folded back. So what we wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, claim in my uh, chapter that even though there could be some good intention in a policy that might get opposed uh, uh, seriously if the policy doesn't uh, incorporate the mood or sentiment of the society or the bigger religious group of the country. So that's all and for the details, uh, uh, I hope you will go back to the do that chapter. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, uh, that's all from my. Thank you, Ms. Zanat. Our next speaker is Mohamed Faisal from Maldiv. Mohamed Faisal, are you there? Uh, I think uh, he is not with us now. Um, so uh, now, now I would like to request distinguished Professor Krishna Menon from Beer Ambedkar University, Delhi, India, to deliver her speech as a discussant. Rudmila, I can see a gentleman, his lips moving, but his uh, camera is muted. Oh, sorry, his uh, sound is muted. Oh. Uh, in the corner of the screen, I think could be he could be the person. Okay, sorry, sir. The the Maldivian person, I think he's there yeah. and he's speaking, but his uh, uh, voice is muted. Okay, okay, Mohammed. Oh, yes. yes, I am asking him to really unmute. Can you help him? Well. Yeah, to unmute his yes. ear. Yes, I'm just trying to actually kind of unmute him. Mm -hmm. Only ask him to unmute. Oh, he's not responding. Okay. Can, can, can I continue? That. Yeah, please. Probably. Okay. Now I would like to request distinguished Professor Krishna Menon from Beer Ambedkar University, Delhi, India, to deliver her speech as a discussant. Thank you, uh, Rudmila. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, friends. At the outset, I'd like to thank North South University, Dhaka, and SIPG. Uh, good afternoon, uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Islam. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. I'm delighted uh, to be able to join you for the launch of the book, Gender Mainstreaming in Politics, Administration and Development in South Asia, edited by uh, Ishtiak Jamil, 
uh, Amin uh, Usman, Sayyid Lasna Kabir, and Mehfuzul Haq, published by Palgrave Macmillan. In the uncertain times that we, uh, that we are living in, uh, when we are faced by the precarity of both lives and livelihoods, it's very reassuring that we can come together in this region and have a meaningful conversation about issues that uh, interest and affect all of us equally. This book has all the makings of one of those volumes that's going to be cited in all future writing on the theme of gender mainstreaming and development in South Asia in particular, but also within the larger arena of uh, feminist politics and South Asian politics in general. This book represents the best of South Asian scholarship. And I say this because it's truly the product of collaborative work and it seeks to address thematic issues that are while being circumscribed by the nation state, also able to sidestep the frame of the nation state. The book has contributions from Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, and the Maldives, and thus has a wide scope and range. As the editors remark in their prefatorial note that gender mainstreaming, despite being on the global stage, since 1995 as part of the Beijing Platform for Action is still beset by a number of problems that they identify as theoretical and empirical, both in terms of organizational lacks, implementation of policies and legislations and participation by women amongst many others. The strength of this volume lies in its approach. In order to look at gender mainstreaming, from a policy and governance perspective, all the chapters engage with critical and important aspects of politics and administration from the vantage point of gender mainstreaming. For instance, the chapter on gender budgeting by uh, Professor Amin Usman is a very exhaustive study of the policies introduced in Bangladesh in 2008, and yet, the author notes that because of the absence of a sound framework of gender analysis, there still remain glaring lacunae in allocation and prioritization of uh, funds. Yet another notable feature of this book is its ability to span both the national and the local levels. Mizanur Rehman and Sangeeta Dhal both engage with the impact of gender mainstreaming at the micro levels and produce new and significant knowledge about emerging leadership in rural Bangladesh and the possibilities and limitations of empowerment of women by participation in e-governance in the state of Odisha in India. Elections, which form the bedrock of politics and government formation in South Asia, is a set of processes and institutions that provide to scholars and analysts a very good entry point into understanding the sociological complexities of a given society. Who votes? Who does not vote? Why not? How do they vote? These are not mere sephological questions, but as Sanjay Kumar's very perceptive analysis demonstrates, it shows us the shifts in power and the nature of social transformation underway in India. R. L. Murias draws our attention to the kind of interventions possible in the funding of election processes in response to the commitment to gender mainstreaming. The theme of employment is dealt with by Lasna Kabir as the author examines the proverbial glass ceiling and the very precarious glass cliff that women in Bangladesh public administration are at the risk of falling off from. The Maldives finds a representation in this volume in the contribution by Mohammad Faisal with reference to the participation of women in paid work and employment. Legal structures that govern property rights in Bangladesh and sexual reproductive and health rights in Pakistan as detailed by Zinat Hussain and Samreen Shahbaz respectively, draw our attention to the centrality of the question of women's autonomy and agency. The chapter by Janetri Lianage and Kamala Lianage 
uh, is a very eloquent and forceful reminder of the need for substantive equality. Their description of gender-based sexual harassment on higher education campuses is very close to the experience of women in this region. Thus, while in India, for instance, we are uh, almost in terms of access to higher education, there is gender parity. Almost 47% of uh, students enrolled in higher education institutions in India today are women. And yet, women will tell you that they experience the space of higher education as a space of exclusion and violence. Why is there this gap between the formal and the substantive? A book such oh, as this. Sorry for the interruption, ask, Professor. What? Sorry for the like interruption. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so then the last bit, let me just conclude then. Thank you. Thank you so much. A book such as this urges us to ask, what is it that we mainstream when we mainstream gender? And I'd like to end by saying that there are two ways of answering this question. Uh, one is to think of gender as a noun, as a fixed category that is descriptive. It is time for us to move away from this category and to think of gender as a verb. So instead of gender mainstreaming, Perhaps it is time for us to move towards gendering the mainstream. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your such an uh, informative speech. Our next designated discussant is Dr. Nazneen Ahmed, Senior Research Fellow from Bangladesh Institute of Development Studies, Dhaka. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think it's good evening. Oh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, speak on a very, I would say one word, very interesting book uh, that's Gender Mainstreaming in Politics, Administration and Development in South Asia. Uh, thanks to SIPG for inviting me to say a few words on this uh, important book. I, uh, for, before I start, I would like to uh, express my inefficiency to uh, say, uh, to review all the chapters because I'm an economist. So when I talk about gender, when I talk about gender mainstreaming, I look into economic empowerment. I look into, yes, uh, uh, the access of women on resources and I look into labor market. I look into gender gap from the perspective of uh, economic issues. Nevertheless, when I got this book and I uh, started reading the overview chapter and the introductory chapter, I found it very interesting and very connected to what I do. So when I was reading, uh, say, the look looked into the chapter on the women's rights on uh, their the inheritance law. I mean, uh, then uh, when uh, because it's very connected to women's access to resources and their economic empowerment. So when I was uh, looking at the chapter uh, where uh, on the election and uh, women's voting rights and how they uh, exercise those rights, that is also related to empowerment because uh, when we measure empowerment in our analysis, in our uh, uh, doctrine of mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Our our um, uh, in Ikana, from the economic perspective. So when we look into women's empowerment, the indicators this, the, we use. Uh, one of the indicator is their uh, voting rights, their mobility, and all those things. So I found that very connected to my work. And uh, then uh, the chapters on uh, other South Asian countries other than Bangladesh, those are also very informative. So I will uh, speak a little bit more on uh, one chapter written by uh, Professor Salahuddin M. Aminu Zaman, not because um, I, uh, uh, I, I ignore the importance of other chapters, but because this is a chapter, this is the topic on gender budget that I have been following from, from my perspective, from my work for a long time. And uh, for your information, I'm part of the uh, uh, panel of economists who formulated the currently ongoing seventh five-year plan of Bangladesh. And I was very closely involved with the gender chapter uh, that was included in the seventh five-year plan. And all 
also I have been working with the government uh, in budget formulation and uh, and um, one of the uh, groups of economists that uh, the finance minister uh, have a discussion every year uh, uh, before uh, giving the national budget. I'm part of that uh, panel of economists for last eight years or so. And I remember, I think it was in 2015, I became very frustrated about the effectiveness of gender budget, which had been given since 2009 for Bangladesh. I became very frustrated and I remember in that meeting before uh, uh, taking the national budget, uh, I I, I told that the then finance minister M. M. Mohit, I, I told him that please stop giving this gender budget because it has no meaning. Why? Exactly, uh, Professor Aminu Zaman has given answer to many of my queries because at that time I, I asked the finance minister, what is the point of giving this uh, gender budget if you don't monitor what impact it is having on women's life? Gender budget does not mean only number that the how much uh, is going to go for uh, uh, what proportion of budget is going for the women rather gender budget means whether that allocation is effective in reducing the gender gap i think professor aminu zaman very rightly elaborated on the conception the misconception that the policymakers and others have on gender budgeting. Even those, the women activists and others who are, you know, fighting for women's rights, usually when they talk about gender budgeting, they just say the numbers. Is it 29% of the budget that goes to women? Is it 25% or 30%? The percentage is not important. Is the most important part, as Professor Aminu Zaman <laughs> has mentioned, that uh, it's what this budget is doing for the woman, whether it's working for the for reducing the inequality and gap. I think he has also rightly pointed out how I, I'll just finish how uh, we can overcome uh, this problem and why it's important to monitor. And I uh, I would like to say this. Um, that uh, not only I have found this chapter very, uh, uh, very uh, interesting, and uh, I uh, for me and also I have found it. Uh, I will. I it, it will really help me in my work uh, because uh, the analysis that I have been looking uh, for a long time on the impact of gender budget. I have found it, and the governance issue has been covered well. I think the whole all the chapters in this book, uh, it is very. Um, it is very relevant for the current stream of work that uh, people are doing on uh, gender issues. I think it will be a very good reference book for the uh, universities. And I would like to request the um, editors and authors to, uh, I will do it from my part, but I think I, I'd like you to request to make this um, book available to the students and uh, through different libraries. Uh, we have to work a long way if we want to achieve the planet 50-50, I think this book is a very good contribution uh, towards that uh, goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, distinguished audience, we are almost at the end of our function. Now let me invite Professor Atikul Islam, respected Vice Chancellor of North South University to formally launch the book and deliver his kind speech. In what order in my life? If I launch the book first, then I may lose my audience for my speech. So do I speak first and then? I think it's better, sir, you speak first and then launch the I'll book. I'll speak first. Oh, OK, OK, OK. I, I won't take a chance, so I'll speak first. Um, distinguished authors, uh, assessors, our all the foreign guests here, I shouldn't say guests, you are you know, friends of ours and uh, uh, what should I say, collaborators with us in good or bad. And um, I'm very pleased to see Dr. Nazmin Ahmed. The reason I'm saying North-South University is an engaged university. We take pride in our engagement with the government with the professions, with industry, with the community at large. And when I say engage, it looks like a loaded word. Uh, let us come to research. The kind of research that we emphasize uh, is a bit different to the traditional universities. The traditional universities might spend millions to, uh, to basically find out how many angels can dance 
on the tip of a pin. It might be of interest to them, but it is not of interest to North South University. We are interested in research that has some impact somewhere. We are interested in research that informs policy making. We have interest in research that will ease people's uh, suffering or promote people's happiness. That kind of research we want we are engaged in. Kind of for it. Professor, I think your microphone is muted. Sir, your microphone is muted. Did you hear what I said before? Yes, yes, yes. Well, yes. How did it get muted? Anyway, Mahbub does mysterious things. Uh, so, so, what we are saying is, this is the kind of research that we like. On the other hand, gender, in, uh, gender equality is an extremely important issue, not only for the developing countries, but also the developed countries. Uh, I, uh, in a way, look which is close to the Nirvana on that issue. Uh, Norway is a country where a male and a female soldier can rule. Sir, you have to mute your Sir, you have to I think it's because of the headphone sometimes it happens. So you have to be careful. Right. Okay, Sir. okay, okay, okay. Right. So, um, Bangladesh or South Asia is a place, it's a very complex place. Religion, caste, ethnicity, all sorts of complex things. And the, and the, and so traditions and cultures and laws and rules and customs that have developed over the thousands to thousands of years is not easily cast aside. So to go to women's empowerment, to have that goal of equality uh, will require very finely tuned policies, very strong policies. At the same time, affirmative action equal opportunity action from the government and from important employers. Uh, uh, so we need reform in the political in the parliament, uh, in representations uh, down the lower level, cascading down the lower level. So there's a hell of a lot to be done. And sometimes people's charity begins at home. I would Sir, you have been muted again. Sir, sir. Parents of this country should know that if they have resources to send two kids to school and they have three kids, it is not the daughter who should be dropped off first. Mothers should know that they should not give the choice piece of meat to the boy rather than the girl. I mean, we should also raise that kind of awareness. So it's at the top level, at the level of government, level of industrial management, business management, at the level of representation of the local governments, even at the level of home. It has been proven that women are better managers. It has been proven women are better caretakers. So what are we going to lose by promoting this equal opportunity? Nothing we are going to gain. Anyway. Sir, you have been muted again. Your valuable time and test your patience on those because uh, I'm not an expert in the area. Now, this is a fantastic book. I've skimmed through it and I found it uh, uh, extremely, extremely interesting. And this could inform lots of policy making in lots of countries. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to unwrap this book and. Uh, launch this book for the view of everyone. Let me say one thing. I thought, you know, what is this thing called uh, uh, gender mainstreaming? I heard lots of the mainstream I haven't heard before. So I went to Google to have a search. But otherwise, I might look like a fool here. And then as soon as I went there, the first 
entry there. The first item there is this book with the picture. I couldn't believe it. This morning I went, yeah. So uh, congratulations once again to all the authors and the uh, organizers of the conference, SIPG and everyone. This is a fantastic book and everyone should. Sir, um, can I request the others to okay. also hold the book, the editors and authors so that we can have a uh, screenshot. We are having this virtual launch. Oh. So Sajjad, please take a screenshot. I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't. I my copy is in office. <laughs> oh no, no problem, Sanjay. It's uh, no problem. Yeah, it's fine for the Sanjay. Yeah, but in anyway, as uh, I, yeah. I haven't so, received mine yet, so I placed an, another order. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you all once again, and I've learned so much sitting through that uh, just about over an hour, um, and. What a shame we don't do these things more often. It enlightens everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, respected right. Vice Chancellor. Right. To for share the that, I haven't, I haven't also got a copy of the book. So I just, just took what? a printout of the cover page and pasted it on another book. That's really good. <laughs> now we know. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what's next, Rudmila? We are, Over to uh, you. We are, okay, thank you, sir. We are at the end of the program. With a vote of thanks, the function would be over. Let me request Dr. M. Mafuzul Hawk, faculty member, SIPG, for offering a vote of thanks. He is also one of the editors of this book. Dr. Mafuz, you will need to unmute yourself. Good evening. Thanks, uh, Rudmila, for offering me this opportunity to. Uh, offer this uh, vote of thanks. It, very short because we are almost uh, close to our uh, Magri prayer, so we should not delay, further de make delay. So the first uh, vote of thanks goes to our distinguished and respected Vice Chancellor, who had been a uh, great admirer of SIPG and for his time and for his encouragement. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, Professor Atibul Islam, the Vice Chancellor of the University. And then our editor, the chief of the editor, and the other members of the editorial board, Stiak Jamil, uh, Salahuddin Mohd Aminu Jamal, Said Lasna Kabir, for their uh, great uh, and hard, painstaking job towards the finalization and uh, towards the publication of this uh, book. Uh, we are very deeply uh, indebted to all of you for your great uh, service. And a special thanks uh, to our uh, a distinguished discussion from India, uh, Professor Krishna Menon, uh, who had been uh, very happy to accept our offer. We are really very uh, grateful for your uh, readiness and willingness to contribute and join the session. Also, thanks to Dr. Nazneen Ahmed. Uh, so this is also an opportunity. We hope to continue our collaboration in the future. Thanks for your contribution. And both have been a very uh, uh, made a very interesting and deep analysis. Perhaps you would have given more time uh, to to contribute. Uh, of course, the uh, the authors they deserve uh, great thanks because of the hard work, and it was a long journey. Uh, but it was again a pleasure to be uh, to see this. Uh, ultimately, this is coming uh, to a reality. And after all, we have a book on gender, and hope this contribution, this collaboration, will continue in future. And our thanks to our uh, distinguished professors, uh, faculty members from both Bangladesh and abroad, our colleagues from um, partner countries, the students of MPPG and alumni. Everybody is so, uh, uh, we, we are so thankful to all of you for this virtual platform. And of course, uh, we must thank our staff, SIPG staff, Mahfuzja and Sajjad for their uh, relentless work. And of course, uh, the the person behind this, uh, Dr. Tafik, for his planning and for uh, giving us every detail uh, to, to make the program so success. So thank you very much. I stop here. We look forward to meeting you again in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, 